It is June 24, 2008. My name is Don Linke. We're here on the campus of Rutgers University in New Brunswick at the Eagleton Institute of Politics. This is another in the series of interviews for the Brendan T. Byrne Archive of the Rutgers Program on the Governor. Uh, this afternoon, we're, we'll be talking with Robert J. Del Tufo, who has served as both U.S. Attorney and Attorney General of New Jersey, uh, and has also uh, served in a variety of roles as first uh, as Assistant Attorney General in the Byrne administration, and currently for Governor Corzine, uh, is serving as Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. Uh, Bob has had a varied uh, role in many of the legal and policy decisions in New Jersey over the last uh, years, and uh, we'll be talking with him about his various uh, uh, roles in state government and his relationships with uh, the uh, different governors of New Jersey. Uh, Bob, I thought we'd start with uh, some general thoughts about how New Jersey has changed over your adult professional life in terms of government, politics, and the law. Any uh, broad comments about how uh, the state has evolved over these many years? Um, well, it's, there's more people. <laughs> I, you know, I think, it's, I think it has ebbed and flowed. I don't think that there's any steady progression one way or the other, but uh, if one starts with uh, with the, uh, I guess we start with Dick. Well, I'll start with, with the Byrne years. Uh, Brendan Byrne uh, assembled a really outstanding cast of uh, people. That it was a terrific cabinet and sub cabinet. And uh, when he he proclaimed that this was government under glass, that there was going to be a lot of transparency, the uh, media took him at his word and and dug around all the time. Uh, which I thought was was good, but all of the people that he put in place were well motivated and talented and did extraordinarily good things. Um, from where I was in the Attorney General's office, uh, there was progress that made there on lots of fronts, including the Division of Criminal Justice, which at that time was functioning uh, very, very well. Uh, it was it was an effective law enforcement uh, agency. Um, I think as as time goes on, I mean, you have uh, you have the you have Kane administration, then you have Governor Florio and Whitman, and um, some of the successor attorneys general were not as good as as uh, Bill Hyland, who with whom I served and. I, I, as I say, I think in terms of effectiveness of that agency went up and down, and it's very important for the Attorney General's office to be effective, especially the Division of Criminal Justice, because it keeps in check the potential for political corruption and other types of conduct. Uh, the division has not been especially effective over the last six or seven years. The United States Attorney, as you know, has 60, 70, 80 corruption cases that have been su successfully handled, but they don't have the resources that are necessary to do the entire job. And the state has to be active and effective in that, and it hasn't been. And <clears throat> I think uh, I think today um, we have uh, a situation in which uh, I, you know, I don't. I don't know that the legislature is, is so terrific, and uh, there are lots of subordinate uh, public officials out there. We have 564 municipalities and all kinds of school districts and all kinds of money, and it has to be kept in check somewhere. I, 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 think the, I just think the climate isn't as positive now as it was back in the Byrne years. Of course, uh, Brendan Byrne was elected on the heels of a political scandal in the Cahill administration and also nationally in the he uh, right after Watergate and the uh, perception that the uh, White House was involved uh, in criminal activity. Um, moving forward, we've had a series of scandals, both at the state level and local level uh, in New Jersey. In your current role as chairman of the 
board of the University of Medicine and Dentistry, you're handling the cleanup of an unfortunate situation involving uh, uh, some uh, uh, wrongdoing. Uh, That's true. Within the university structure. Uh, again, taking in the long view, uh, why does New Jersey get into these sort of cycles of corruption despite the attempts of Brendan Byrne and other reformers at various cycles to clean things up? And uh, still, today, we seem to be dealing with some of the same problems and issues. I think perhaps all these problems are endemic. I think that they're there, and it depends upon who's in office and, and uh, the effectiveness of remedial efforts. And I think that, that a lot of that depends on, in New Jersey, on, on law enforcement and on uh, criminal justice and on the role of the Attorney General in overseeing what the prosecutors are doing and trying to create an effective, uh, effective system of law enforcement uh, throughout the state. And it really depends on, on personnel. Um, I mean, Governor Corzine and his administration has very good people, lots of people from Goldman Sachs who are independently wealthy and are, <clears throat> are uh, trying to do a good job. And I think the present Attorney General, Ann Milgram, is uh, well motivated and trying to move in positive direction. So I think, I think we're on an upswing with, uh, with Governor Corzine, but it o hasn't always, uh, always been that way. As I said before, New Jersey is particularly vulnerable to corruption because of the amount of money that's floating around and the amount of governmental units that have money to spend. Uh, I think it must be some human trait that there is a motivation towards personal gain and, and perhaps not staying on the, on the right track. Um, a lot happens in the legislature now through campaign contributions, which the bribery statute was amended by the legislature to take out campaign contributions as anything that could be looked at in terms of influencing one's uh, vote and the like. And there's uh, from I don't there are some very very fine legis le legislators, uh, but there's a lot of that going on. Um, is there anything structurally, do you think, in New Jersey government that lends itself toward corruption? You mentioned before the high number of municipalities we have uh, in comparison to our geographic area. Uh, are there just too many uh, to sort of keep local officials accountable or to watch from a law enforcement perspective? I would say yes. Um, I mean, when I was with the Criminal Justice Agency, we would review every allegation that, that came in and people knew we were doing that. So I think it kind of kept everybody at bay to a certain extent. But there really are too many governmental units out there and too much uh, potential for mischief. You know, um, going way back to... Uh, Right after I had left my clerkship with Chief Justice Weintraub, I was doing some work for the County Municipal Law Revision Commission, and I think uh, I think Clive Cummins was in charge of it at that time. And I did a report on changing the structure of New Jersey government by eliminating lots of municipalities and put them in larger units, either either counties or or thing, uh, if if geographically and culturally one part of a county and another part of another county fit together to make that a unit and to try and also for for planning and zoning so that you would look at a broader perspective that the uh, the a movement towards a more consolidated form of government county government uh, or larger unit government would be would be very desirable i remember harry sears i think took this up and introduced it into the legislature. And you can imagine how far it got. Mm -hmm. There's so, much, so many vested interests in 564. But I think that would, I think that would go a long way towards, uh, towards making it uh, easier for law enforcement to detect things and also making it more, serving as a deterrent to people to doing something, uh, something wrong. Short of that, there ought to be some consolidation of municipalities. As you know, there are plenty of places where the borough is the hole in the donut and a township surrounds it. 
and there's no reason, I know there's been some consolidation of services, but there's no reason why two governments are there and it's expensive and they should uh, exist. Uh, I remember going to make, just as an anecdote, going to make a speech, this is back in the burn time when I was criminal justice director, to the Chiefs of Police uh, Association at their annual meeting. Um, I probably should have thought of this more carefully, but the speech was all about consolidation of, of services and municipalities and how we should get rid of all these local mm -hmm. units, and there wasn't much applause at the end of the speech. Uh, interesting. Now, you mentioned that the, the Division of Criminal Justice um, has taken, I think in most people's eyes, somewhat of a backseat uh, role to the U.S. Attorney's Office in recent years. Uh, from a law enforcement perspective, uh, the State Division has the authority, probably more authority for investigation and uh, action uh, than many, if not most states. Are there any other reforms on the state legal uh, side that you'd suggest? To, to do what? Uh, to s sort of strengthen the, the role of the, the state in terms of uh, comb combating corruption. Um. Off the top, I would say, I say, say we have one of the best structural systems in the country. In fact, uh, uh, again, during the burn years, uh, we had attorneys general and people come visit New Jersey and look at the structure of the, the Criminal Justice Act and things and the civil remedies that we had and, and the like and try to put that together in other states. I think it's a question of, of making sure that, that you have the right personnel and and that you're you have leaders who are going to make whatever is going to go on effective and you know it comes sometimes down to mundane things you, you you really have to and to attract people you have to make sure that you're competitive in the salary range of things right now i think assistant prosecutors make uh, uh, more annually than than uh, deputy attorneys general so there's been a there's been a drain from the criminal justice division out to the prosecutor's offices, whereas back in the burn years, the, the criminal justice agency was an elite agency and there was movement in the opposite direction. And uh, I mean, <coughs> for example, when I was criminal justice director, Ed Steer was there. He was the deputy director. Uh, he's extraordinarily uh, talented and the like. Bob Winter, uh, uh, people like that uh, who were extraordinarily well versed in, in how to do things and were, were uh, honest and well motivated and were active activists in getting things done. Bob, let's now proceed somewhat chronologically. You're born 1933 in Newark in the midst of the Depression. Uh, from your earliest memories, what was Newark like uh, and what was the, your family background? Um, Starting with my family background, both of my parents uh, emigrated here from Italy. Uh, my mother came from Puglia, which is the heel of the uh, of the boot, and my father came from Campania, which is west of east of uh, uh, Naples. You know, both from southern southern Italy. <coughs> uh, my wife and I did visit uh, Italy maybe five or six years ago and found both villages. My mother's was particularly interesting. It was a, just a hill town near Foggia in Italy uh, with a like a 12th century Norman fortification on at the very peak of it. Lots of activity, lots of young people and the like. It was, it was, uh, it was nice to be able to uh, see it. My mother was 13 when she came here. My father was an infant. My mother's experience, which I think probably bears on some of the experiences today, she, she was here and she went to school and it was sink or swim in terms of the language and somehow people managed to uh, to assimilate English and, and, to, uh, and to progress. Um, I was kind of a late arrival. My brother and my sister were substantially older uh, than I was and uh, my parents would not speak uh, Italian in front of uh, 
the children. And of course, I was a real pain because because they, they wanted people to be American. We we're here in America. And I wanted to be American too, so I didn't want to hear it. And uh, accordingly, right now, I can't speak Italian very well, which really disappoints me. I wish I could go back and, and do it uh, all over again. Um, and I remember, uh, th this really isn't it's very trivial to what you're, what you're doing, but I remember life being different. I, I remember cold being delivered. I remember uh, uh, bakers, the Dugan Bakery, coming to the door with a big tray of cakes and breads and the like and selling door to door. I can still remember carts going by to sharpen knives and the like. There was a, uh, a, a police officer at the intersection of uh, uh, Park Avenue and Roosevelt Avenue named Dick who used to come up every once in a while and have a cup of coffee and go back and, and stand there in direct traffic and help uh, people out. I mean, it was it was a different uh, it was a different time. I went to the public school there in Newark f for a time, and then my family sent me to Newark Academy, which at that time was located on First Street in uh, Newark. And I I spent uh, that's where I got my <coughs> grammar and high school education. What did your father do for a living? Um, I think my father started out when he first uh, when he first became of age in this country as a tailor, and then he was uh, he was an alderman in Newark for a while, and he got into uh, some banking business, and in his later years uh, operated an underground uh, parking lot, which is right under. Uh, right near Gateway. It's right under the state office building that used to be there that's just been renovated. It's a vast uh, thing. And uh, he was, uh, I, d I was never very close to my father. He was very ill most of the time, most of my life. He had some type of blood poisoning which uh, should have killed him but didn't. And um, he, <coughs> he was not in great shape. Uh, for the rest of his life, but he was active and did these uh, did these things. Mm -hmm. But they managed both. My parents managed to get my brother and m my sister and myself through uh, college and through professional school as well. Now, did you have a feel for the economic impact of those times? Uh, you know, in your early years. <coughs> in what sense, Don? Well, the depression and the uh, sort of tough times that people were going through, particularly in larger cities? You know, I don't, I don't remember the impact of the Depression. Um, I do have a recollection of President Roosevelt coming forth and putting in some remedial measures, but I was pretty young <coughs> at, uh, at that point in time. Um, I, do, I do remember uh, where I was when, on December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And you had been about eight years old, I guess. Yeah, I was in the dining room listening to Jack Armstrong or something like that when the, the news came in. Um, I remember when they had uh, a big uh, fishbowl in Washington for the draft and someone was going to pick out the name of the first draftee. I remember coming home from school and hoping that my brother would get his name picked because it would be, I'm sure he didn't feel that way, but, um, and he did serve in the, uh, in the army. I remember uh, food rationing and, and gasoline rationing. Um, you know, to get, to get uh, meat was not available every day and <coughs> you had to use your ra rationing uh, coupons uh, judiciously to, uh, to serve meals and take care of your family. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it was an entirely different time. I guess, I guess one thing that, that, uh, that sticks in my mind about that time is the, is the unity of people in the country. I mean, here was a, a, a threat, a real threat to civilization and to our way of living. And everybody had to get involved in that effort. You remember uh, women going to work in the defense plants and uh, I mean, I, I d my part was growing a victory garden in the backyard so that uh, we could get something uh, something from that. But it was a sense of 
of camaraderie and, and common purpose. Now, it's too bad that it's a war that generates that kind of unity and common purpose. If we could get together like that uh, all the time, it would, be, it would be wonderful. And that's really a contrast to what's happening today with Iraq. This is the people, we, we have not bought in as a society to go, to go deal with this jointly in the same way. And probably the reason is that there's not a draft and that um, kids are recruited out of high school and the like to, to, to serve in a, in a permanent uh, professional uh, army. And uh, it's almost like uh, living in England must have been during World War I. The war is going on and everybody's just going along <coughs> doing, living their lives and not, uh, not really being as impacted as, as they should. Discuss a bit more your education at the Newark Academy. Was it difficult to get in in those days? I don't know. I got in. I was there. I, I went into very, I think it was like second grade, so I'm sure there weren't, <laughs> there weren't a lot of uh, tests about that. But it was, a, it was really a great uh, building and a great, uh, and a great school, and I got an extraordinarily good education. I think, in fact, Secondary education may be more important than any other stage of education in, in building habits and information and, and the like. A, a great uh, math teacher, uh, we were doing calculus in, in our junior year, so it made going to college a lot easier. A great uh, chemistry professor and an English teacher who was just perfect for getting people interested in reading and doing things that that were very constructive uh, in that sense of the word so it was uh, it was great and uh, I played some sports there and uh, participated in some how do you feel the whole rest of the afternoon <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Bob, we had a bit of a technical audio problem, so I'm not quite sure whether your last response uh, was adequately uh, recorded. Why don't we go back to your reminiscences of uh, teachers and courses at the North Academy? Okay, as I say, I started there uh, pretty young and uh, uh, worked up through grammar school. I remember uh, get in high school particularly a... Um, uh, a math teacher who was extraordinary and made got everyone really excited about doing things and and getting into uh, areas which at that time were usually just explored for the first time in college like calculus and the like uh, extraordinary science teachers particularly in chemistry and uh, an English instructor Mr. Boynton Bob Boynton who was very laid back and <clears throat> not pushy, but somehow motivated all of us to to read and do things. I can remember uh, before I was in his class having a summer assignments to read like two books and finding it difficult to uh, to concentrate and get through them. But with Boynton made it uh, uh, interesting and it's and. Soon everybody was in the habit of, of reading a lot, and I did major in English when I went to uh, English literature when I went to uh, college. So I mean, it was a it was a great experience and gave a real foundation for for moving forward. And there were opportunities to engage in uh, sporting activities and other things, student newspapers and uh, yearbooks, drama uh, club. I remember being in uh, command decision. Uh, Captain Jenks was the uh, was the role that I had, and I just digress to say that I I really thought that I was terrific. And when I went to college, uh, I walked by <coughs> a theater called the Theater on Team. It's right on the campus, and they were they were casting for Tiger at the Gates, Shiradov's Tiger at the Gates. So I went in and read for it. And again, I came out thinking, I'm going to get the lead. I am really, really good. And they posted uh, the who was going to 
be in the play and what parts they had on a bulletin board outside the theater. And I went up to look at it, and I looked for my name all the way down. And at the bottom, there were two guards. And one of them said, halt, and the other one said, nothing. And the second one was me. <laughs> so I, uh, it discouraged my theatrical uh, course of action. Hmm. Now, did your parents articulate the importance of education to you, or was it more just an understood thing because they were pushing you and your, and your siblings uh, to the best education available? Yeah, I, I, pushing is the, is the wrong word. Providing opportunity is really what it is. They did speak over and over again about the importance of education and, and going to uh, high school and college and in order to uh, really succeed in, in this society. I think that, and I, I don't think this is common to myself, I think it's common to a lot of people. One of the things that, that, that motivated uh, one is the realization that your parents were sacrificing just about everything to get their kids into good schools and through college. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of like throwing, having a soldier throw himself uh, on the barbed wire and having people be able to walk across uh, into, into safety. So that, I, I know that uh, my siblings felt that way and I know a lot of kids in similar circumstances felt that way. You just really had to succeed because you couldn't let that kind of sacrifice pass uh, without recognizing it and honoring it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned your older brother who would later also become U.S. Attorney for New Jersey. Uh, was he a role model for you at this age? Uh, he was. I, I, he really kind of looked out for me uh, because, as I mentioned to you before, my father was not uh, in great physical health. So he was like a father figure to me. Um, and I guess he was a role model as far as, as uh, a career path is concerned. Although I did uh, prefer to go to English graduate school in Dublin uh, and do more with the Irish poets and playwrights, but I applied too late for a Fulbright, so I said I'll go to law school. Can't hurt to go <laughs> to law school. But uh, yeah, he was a role model, and, and uh, when he came, when he was discharged from the army, went to Rutgers Law School and then started practicing. Of course, you obviously did well at Newark Academy because your next stop is in Princeton. Uh, had you had any contact with Princeton as a town or university uh, up to the point of enrolling? I had been there on several occasions. My brother went there as well. And uh, I'd been to some football games and had walked around uh, around campus. I, I played uh, <coughs> football in, uh, in one of the sports in high school. There was the quarterback. And I, I was pretty good, but not great. And, and th at that time, Princeton was ranked like fifth or sixth in the country. Dick Kazmaier and, I mean, they were, the Princeton Cornell game, you couldn't buy a ticket. You know, 60,000 mm -hmm. people would, uh, would flock to it. If Cor Cornell was sixth or seventh. Uh, it was it was amazing. So I, I didn't think that, um, I thought that competition would be too high in terms of sports there. And I was just thinking of sports. And uh, I thought about going to Amherst or Williams, which are great schools and smaller. And that would have been a good experience too. Uh, but I remember my father, who was still pretty ill, uh, this is probably one of the only meaningful conversations I ever had with him, but he just started talking about schools and uh, he did not say you should go to Princeton or go to Princeton, I'm not, you know, you have to go there or, or the like, mm -hmm. but he just started talking and I can't remember what he said, but at the end of the conversation I made up my mind that if I had the opportunity to go to Princeton I should to do it and I did. How about your brother? Did he urge you to go to Princeton? Did he what? Did he urge you to, to follow him at Princeton? Um, no. No. Did, well, did you discuss with him what Princeton was like? I assume you must have. 
probably from time to time. And I guess the fact that he had been there made it somewhat less intimidating that he had uh, been accepted and uh, knew. Yeah, it was. It really, it really was familiar territory. You know, you were uh, you know about the campus and where my brother roomed. He roomed in Blair Tower at the top uh, with a bunch of guys at one point. So, mm -hmm. any memories of uh, special professors or courses at Princeton? Um, I remember some great uh, lecturers in, in uh, history and English. I, I just can't come up with the names at the moment. But mm -hmm. it was, you know, Princeton, it was very good because they had a, a lecture. <clears throat> if you take a, took a course, there was a lecture and a, a lot of people in it. And then it was divided into things called precepts, which were small groups of people. And they had an instructor. And you would discuss the same things that were hit in the lecture. So it was, uh, you got a lot of information and you also had the, the opportunity to have a dialogue and dig into things. Mm -hmm. and you said you weren't certain about a law career when you reached graduation, that you might have preferred a more academic course in English or literature. Uh, That's uh, the road, the road <laughs> not taken, I guess. But you know, uh, I really had no idea what what I w wanted to do as I was going through college, and and I run into uh, kids these days who are really perplexed when they're freshmen. They say, "My, you know, I'm I'm floundering. I don't know what it is I want to do." And my suggestion to them is, you know, don't worry about it. Uh, it'll come to you at some point. There's some great benefit just to having a liberal arts education, and then you'll try something. And if it's not to your liking, you can always do something else. So. I don't think, I don't, except if you're in a science, like to become a doctor or something like that, where you have to take certain courses. I think that uh, people ought to be more flexible and not worry about it. Now, you said that you uh, applied to law school without any great, I guess, yearning to become a, a lawyer, at least at that point. Um, did you ever get that yearning during your law school days, or was it later that uh, you really sort of fell in love with the law? Well, as, as you, I think, will probably know and agree, the first year or the first term at law school is, is awful <laughs> because you come in with a, uh, a black and white brain and you're looking at a legal problem and you think there's an answer to it. It's, it should be very this is the right answer and this is the wrong answer. And um, I didn't do very well in my, uh, my first term. I mean, it really was that kind of thing really got to me. And then, then when you learn that just to be flexible and keep an open mind, because the law is not black and white, it's gray, and you make arguments on both sides, and you have policy things and the like. When you get, if you can get that mindset, then it becomes relatively easy. And I had some epiphany uh, towards the end of my first term and and got into that mode and then really started to like it a lot uh, and decided to uh, to give it a whirl. Well, any special areas or courses in law school that uh, attracted you more than others? Um, there were some great prof I took some some uh, tax courses Boris Bitker was the tax professor doing spin-offs and split-ups and uh, lecturing about uh, <coughs> very sophisticated income tax uh, consequences of, of business transactions. There was a, a, a great guy teaching a, a state tax. There was a criminal law teacher. There was J.W. Moore, who was very pretty famous, who was teaching about creditors' rights and bankruptcy. Uh, it really, it was just a varied uh, plate and and uh, a lot of them were I mean those that were equally uh, interesting. Well as you get closer toward graduation what did you see as your career options? You know I think uh, around that point in time well I, th there was the possibility of going to a large firm in a big city like uh, like New York and uh, and then the opportunity to have a judicial clerkship arose, and so I thought that was a good thing to do. 
in terms of finances, were you paying your way through jobs in law school? Was it uh, family funded? How did you manage it? It was, um, I, I was on a scholarship both in college and in, in uh, law school and uh, did uh, work to add additional income to support myself and I, I was married uh, probably after my first year in law school so that increased the burden a little bit. So did the economic pressure sort of lean, push you in one way or another, for example, taking more of a private law firm job than going into public service? No, I, I um, it was really the, the kind of opportunities and, and work. I think I've always kind of been that way. Uh, uh, when I had an opportunity to go down with Bill Hyland in the burn years, I had a good law practice and I was certainly concerned about what there would be when I came back, which would be nothing. But it, it was an opportunity to do something that seemed to be extraordinarily interesting and broadening. And when the uh, judicial clerkship came along, uh, I would have done that uh, regardless of uh, the circumstances. I think my salary then was $6,000, which back then was a lot of money. And as I recall, it wasn't too much lower than you probably would have gotten in a large law firm. That's right. right. <laughs> a lot different now yeah. nowadays. Nine minutes left. Okay. Uh, well, we've talked separately a little bit about your uh, clerkship uh, with the state Supreme Court, Chief Justice Weintraub, but there may be different people reading <laughs> this interview than the other, so let's rehash a little bit about that as, to, as you're coming out of law school and what you're interviewing for and uh, the various options you have and what you finally decide to do. I do not recall pursuing any interview with, with a law firm. There were lots of law firms who came to the school and, and uh, were interviewing, recruiting people. You know, the larger firms uh, do that. Um, but I went down to visit uh, who, then Justice uh, Joseph Weintraub, and I think my brother had uh, an impact in getting me the interview because he, he, uh, <coughs> he knew the justice. And we had a uh, really kind of pleasant conversation, not anything that delved into legal matters or, or the like, but more a, a personal exchange. And uh, I was offered the clerkship and I, I, uh, I took it. Um, I'm sorry, I lost track of what was the question. Well, uh, I think you, you've, you've gotten to where we, we were. Uh, okay. But you, you're hired by Chief Justice Weintraub. We've discussed some of the uh, cases that you you worked on in his personal style, but uh, I think you've said that uh, from a personal standpoint, he was uh, cordial and open, uh, but he was also very self-assured in his own opinions and the way he wrote his opinions and how he uh, directed the court. He was cordial and, and friendly and always willing to speak to his uh, law secretaries or law clerks about uh, issues and and to spend time discussing them which was important but he was he was friendly but reserved uh, he I mean there was no no uh, uh, it was prof a professional type of relationship it wasn't uh, didn't extend into into the personal um, he was uh, a really very brilliant mind and a brilliant thinker and uh, he would each law clerk uh, wrote a memorandum for the court on a pending case or cases they had arguments with for seven or eight cases every two weeks and uh, he would discuss with the law clerk the, the memoranda that that his uh, his clerks prepared, and uh, it was it certainly was not uh, his style to have a law clerk write anything by way of an opinion and then have him look at review it and edit it and do it that way. He did everything <coughs> himself, 
we worked very, very hard. And I think uh, you've mentioned uh, before our interview that this was about the first time you came into uh, contact with Brendan Byrne. Is that true? That's true. We were um, the the, our, the, the uh, Chief Justice Weintraub's chambers were at 520 Broad Street, which was the mutual benefit building in those days on the 16th floor, and there were a bunch of other judges whose chambers were there: Justice Jacobs, Justice Francis. For a while, uh, Judge Gawkin of the appellate division, and then later Justice uh, Scatino, and <clears throat> their chambers were to the rear of the the uh, quarters when one comes in. Right in the as you come in the door, there's that was where the library was, uh, and I was introduced to uh, Brendan Byrne um, when he, he visited Chief Justice Weintraub uh, on occasion from time to time. I think he started visiting him when he was still working for Governor Minor, perhaps as secretary to Governor Minor. I never really spoke to him at that time, but uh, because he would go and talk to Chief Justice, they were very good friends. Probably getting some some advice on things that were ongoing in government. I think he may have uh, become Essex County prosecutor while I was still there, but he still visited uh, Chief Justice Weintraub on occasion. Uh, Chief Justice Weintraub had the reputation to those who had less of a daily relationship with him than you as a clerk of being somewhat intimidating perhaps because of his intellectual force, uh, at least to lawyers uh, who dealt with them and lawyers before the court. Uh, do you think that was a fair perception, or accurate perception? To, to a certain extent. I, I, I don't think he would um, be a person to, to tolerate uh, false or frivolous arguments or incompetence or the like. Uh, but he was always courteous to everyone. He was in... in uh, I guess had an intensive way of uh, approaching things, and when he was asking questions from the uh, from the bench, would uh, would be disciplined in how he put the questions together and the responses that he wanted and the like. So, he w if if somebody thought he was intimidating, it's because he was extraordinarily intelligent and well prepared and had the questions and asked questions uh, that he wanted to ask and expected answers to those questions. But um, in terms, he, he was he was a very, his, his uh, uh, as a judge, he was, he was courteous and, and, and good. His, he, he was not uh, in any way uh, hostile to anyone. And I think you've also said that the relationship among the other justices was very cordial and friendly. They, there was no question who was the leader of the court, but everyone really worked uh, together, and there was not uh, not any sense of antagonism anywhere. And there were strong personalities on that court, like Justice Ga Jacobs and Justice Francis and Justice Hall, uh, Justice Proctor. Um, they they were their own people. Bob, before we took our break. Uh, you were discussing the two years you spent as law secretary or clerk to Chief Justice Weintraub. Uh, he also had the image, as we've discussed, as a fairly conservative on criminal uh, matters and issues. Uh, I've heard from separate sources that he had a directive that bookmakers at the street level be given very stiff sen sentences by lower courts because he saw that as the sort of entrance way to the ladder of organized crime in New Jersey. Um, how did you sort of view it from your position as a, as a clerk uh, for the court? Well, um, I guess in working on things and also on uh, and discussions with him, he, he was on the criminal side more or less a law and order person. And he was, uh, <coughs> I, I but if he showed passion, it would be a, a <clears throat> passionately against organized crime and and what and their infiltration and what it means. And I think he viewed the bookmaking activity 
as you put it, as an entrance into organized crime, as financing a lot of the other things that come from it. Not to say that the other practices aren't a financing mechanism as well, but that this was uh, this was pretty important, uh, and it, that would lead to the to prostitution, to all kinds of uh, of other things. He was. Uh, I remember speaking to him after Map v. Ohio when the uh, uh, the <coughs> U.S. Supreme Court put in the search and seizure rule, the Fourth Amendment strictures, and uh, he was concerned about that because he, from a law enforcement standpoint, he thought that uh, it would it would create arbitrary rules, and it it does to a certain extent. I mean, I can remember cases that. Are discuss over 20 pages whether the garbage can is part of the house or or not. I mean, some of this is, is ridiculous. But he, he, he wanted to let to, to have law enforcement officers have the flexibility to do their job if they acted reasonably. And he was concerned that, that MAP would, uh, this is a pretty harsh way to put it, but, that, but I think this is the way he put it, would turn police officers into liars because they would <coughs> be, be uh, they think it's their duty to put drug dealers, for example, uh, away. And if they arrested uh, someone uh, and searched him and found some, some uh, say, some heroin, that they might testify that the, uh, the person dropped the bag and it was in plain view, and they could, they picked it up uh, and and. Uh, uh, that's when that's when they were arrested and searched. He did he did in in criminal law also have a uh, um, what's the right word not fatalistic but but he had a he well first of all he had a view of the world to a certain extent as being a lot motivated by chance uh, the chance when when someone is uh, is born uh, why. Why me and not uh, not someone else, and and the things that progress uh, through life. I I do remember a case, uh, State v. Williams, in which uh, it would sticks in my mind too. And and it, I, I'm not sure if he wrote the opinion or a concurring opinion, but I know that that he was into this in in terms of of how things happen and and how just a a fraction of uh, a second or or a different uh, approach to things could change everything but this this case struck me and I'll be very brief uh, Williams was a fellow who had just graduated from police academy in um, in Newark and he was he went down uh, to uh, bars down in the ironbound section to celebrate his graduation. He graduated and he, and he was issued a, a firearm because he was a police officer now. And there was a guy by the name of Manuel Tuso, uh, that name sticks in my mind, who was a, who was a Portuguese uh, illegal immigrant in the United States. And their paths uh, just crossed. Uh, I mean, it was it's one in a, in a million. They, Tuso's coming out of pla some place and Williams is going in and, and he really was uh, anxious to show his new authority and his new role as a as a police officer and he detected something and told Tuso to stop and Tuso turned around and just started walking towards Williams which led to Williams shooting him in the thigh uh, and another chance it severed some artery that was critical and Tuso died. Um, and if you can just think of all those uh, circumstances, I just, I always had the feeling that Tuso had been through so much running and and being uh, afraid of apprehension as an illegal immigrant that he just had enough when Williams turned, and he was just walking towards him, and he would not uh, stop when, when told to. And Williams, with a career in front of him, did a very foolish thing. Hmm. That was second-degree murder conviction. I mean, it's just bad for everyone. Hmm. Now, as we've discussed separately, Unlike today, where justices are sort of labeled liberal or conservative, and 
tend to uh, follow that uh, path, whether the perception is right or wrong. Uh, Chief Justice Weintraub's leanings as a more conservative on criminal issues was balanced a bit by consumer and other civil uh, uh, issues. So discuss a little bit about that dichotomy, if, if, if that's accurate. I'm not sure it is. Well, I think, I think what drove him was his concept of fairness and justice. And I think he was moved by the facts of, uh, of cases and also by precedents and what the decision by the court, uh, court would mean. I think, I think that uh, would explain his uh, philosophy about criminal law. He was looking for something that would be fair and right for society and for the individual. But he was conservative on that side because he thought law enforcement should, should have more leeway to do its job. Uh, on the civil side, uh, he was also motivated by searching for fairness and, and justice and uh, would join with other people on the court in trying to, to knock down barriers for individuals to find <laughs> justice and fairness. Uh, one case that I remember is the Henningsen v. Ford Motor Company case, which had to do with products liability, a decision that uh, Judge Francis, uh, an opinion Judge Francis wrote. Um, but again, with the leadership of Weintraub, uh, the court moved unanimously in in that way. It was a revolutionary decision at the time. Don't ask me how it was revolutionary, <laughs> but it was. So and war I, I warranties, though, wasn't it? Yeah, it was about war. <laughs> it's about all I See? <laughs> <laughs> but as I said to you before, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take a look at some of these. Uh, I'll flip through the, through the um, reporters and try to come up with some more examples. Uh, at this point, as you're ending your clerkship in 1960, I believe, uh, I wanted to backtrack a little and compare the Newark where you're working uh, for Chief Justice Weintraub, the Newark you grew up in, and the Newark that some years later would erupt in the Newark riots. Um, how did the ethnic uh, mix change uh, from your childhood through the 60s? Um, I think probably as I was growing up, Newark was a predominantly uh, Caucasian uh, society. It was uh, an extraordinarily beautiful city. I mean, nice homes. The downtown was was. Uh, was also very pleasing. There were restaurants. I remember my mother taking me to Schraff's restaurant on, on Broad Street, um, which was a real treat and was very elegant place. And they were all, all over the place. And there were department stores, with Bamberger's, Kresge's, Haynes, uh, and, it was, and movie theaters. Proctor's movie theater, the Brantford, and of course, uh, uh, I, I can't think of the name. <laughs> there was a burlesque show around the corner at the uh, at the Adams Theater. <laughs> <laughs> we have some oh, help. So, some, <laughs> somebody was there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I remember uh, my parents uh, taking me to Proctor's Theater to see how green was my valley with uh, Greer Garson and Walter Pigeon. And that goes, that goes uh, way back. But <clears throat> Newark, uh, that same stretch now has, is a series of not attractive shops, but if if, if you're if you're on uh, Halsey Street and and uh, Market Street, sometime if, if you look up at the top, you can see a remnant of of the uh, of Proctor's Theater. Mm. So it was one of those ornate theaters that are, are uh, redone, uh, re restored uh, these days, um, and it was a, a, it was very safe. I, <clears throat> as a fairly young kid, I was permitted to take the bus downtown and walk around and shop and do whatever and and come back home on the bus. I mean that, you know, 9, 10, 11, maybe it was 12, I don't know, but it was, I was very young. Um, I, I don't know uh, exactly what happened, but the, uh, a theory, this was expressed by some other people too, is that during the mobilization for World War II, 
there were in this in the Newark in the greater New Newark New York area a lot of defense plants that were very active, and to have those defense plants staffed, uh, a lot of uh, African Americans from the South came north and worked in those defense plants. And my my gut feeling is that the war ended. Uh, there were there was still this African American population. Um, it it was not uh, and there was wasn't work for them anymore. And and everyone just neglected the situation and just forgot about people who might be economically disadvantaged. And um, that was the it was there to explode in in the uh, in the sixties. Um, Newark has then really changed dramatically. I mean, the department stores uh, closed. Th there were eating clubs, the downtown club on the top of Bamberger's, the Essex Club, which was a beautiful brownstone on Park Place, because uh, people, as, as Newark became uh, less attractive, professional people and business people moved out. They went out to the suburbs, went to Roseland or or Livingston or some place like that. And so there was no uh, more clientele for the club, so they they closed. And then uh, the population became predominantly uh, African American. And then, of course, after that, uh, Hispanic uh, people moved into the, uh, into the city. And uh, there was still a lot of uh, economic uh, disadvantage and downturn. And then there were efforts made to rehabilitate the city. I remember Newark fighting back, which goes back to the 1990s, uh, where people banded together. Prudential had a lot of influence uh, and supplied money to do a variety of things. Uh, but there was um, nothing was particularly uh, successful. Now, I guess, with the, with the Performing Arts Center and with the new arena, uh, the Performing Arts Center has had an impact on, on the surrounding area, and it's it's provided a real service for the community. I mean, they they're kids who go there, and they're it, it caters to the Newark population as well as people coming in from outside. Um, so, if that continues to be a success and the arena is a success, perhaps there will be a more uh, positive development. I think there has been, and I hope that it continues. Uh, from your early education in Newark Academy, how did the ethnic uh, community sort of stick together? Did the kids basically stay with the Italians and the Irish and so forth, or was it more heterogeneous? It, in, the, in the school, it was more heterogeneous. Uh, hetero excuse me. We know what you mean. Uh, there was... Uh, I don't think there were necessarily cliques like that, but there was some, some, uh, not discord, but distance between people who lived in some of the suburbs and were more affluent, and people like myself who were Italian and lived in Newark and were not as uh, affluent. And <clears throat> there was a lot of discrimination in those times, and I'm talking about uh, uh, ethnic type of discrimination against Italians and. Uh, I think the Irish had had been assimilated by that time, but there was uh, there were distinct feelings that were not uh, uh, pleasurable, and I don't think that the African American population had gotten to the point to to move into this milieu, like school, like North Academy. I can't remember there being a lot of diversity uh, there. In fact, maybe none. Um, which was regrettable, mm -hmm. but then, you know, the the uh, discrimination on as to one's uh, country or background seemed to fade, but the discrimination against African Americans seemed to rise and and <clears throat> led to a lot of uh, violence in Newark. Mm. Uh, pointing again to 1960, what was your perception of the? political leadership at the time within the city and the different pressures, I guess, from ethnic communities looking for, I guess, more representation? 
I'm, tr I'm trying to think who was... Uh, I know well, you had Anizio. Would he have been mayor in well, I, I, I think so. Maybe it was in the 70s, though. Uh, no, maybe it was then. It was then. Um, I don't think people have realized at that point in time that Newark had, with Adonizio, a, a bad, very bad deal and would have a bad deal right up until the, uh, until the present time. Um, I remember Mayors Carlin, uh, I can't think of, of some of the names. Mayor Raymond, of course, was there. Mm -hmm. That's why Raymond Boulevard and the constructed Penn Station. There were the mayors back in the in the early uh, 20th century that that moved Newark along, and then there were people who who uh, sacked it, uh, so to speak, and were corrupt. And Adonizio was was very corrupt. He was, uh, and that connected with uh, organized crime. Now those cases were prosecuted by the U.S. Attorney's Office, Fred Lacey and and Herb Stern, but. The cases were developed by Brendan Byrne in the Essex County Prosecutor's Office. And I can't exactly give you chapter and verse, but the evidence was there and the Prosecutor's Office had, uh, had put it, uh, had produced it, and it was taken uh, by the U.S. Attorney. I, now, I'm not sure if that was the 60s or 70s. I'm really confused as to, mm -hmm. the, uh, as to the time. But then it was followed by a succession of mayors that gave Newark hope, but turned out not to fulfill that hope. Uh, Ken Gibson was a, an engineer, a young man, and <clears throat> had uh, professed to have the, the right uh, approach to things and wanted to move Newark and, along and, be, and get it back to an honest, uh, to an honest uh, status. And he started out that way. Uh, he didn't, at the end, uh, it wasn't there anymore. And then I guess we, we had Sharp James, who did a lot of positive things uh, for the city during the, the riots, and of course was an effective personality and effective leader. But um, I, I, uh, I don't want to uh, say ill of anybody, but I don't think that he was governing properly for a long time. Uh, he was, of course, recently been convicted of, uh, of a crime, but I think I think the people deserve better uh, during his tenure. Now, Cory Booker's there, and and God bless him, he's trying his best, and uh, he certainly is a positive force. Well, let's go back uh, to your personal career again. 1960, uh, you're ending your second year of your clerkship with the Chief Justice. Um, you're looking also, I guess, at family responsibilities, but what, what did you see as your, your choices and what the options were? I uh, felt at that time that I, I did not wish to be part of a large organization, that I wanted to practice in a, a smaller uh, venue. Um, which is uh, ironic given where I'm, I'm practicing now, now <laughs> which there's over, like over 2,000 lawyers. Um, so I actually went up to Morristown because I looked around the state This is and tried to see a place that I would like to live, and Morristown seemed, hmm. this is not the way you should do it if anybody <laughs> is looking for a lesson or a precedent. But I, I, I like Morristown a lot, and I went up there and I just walked around to law firms. I went to Skank Price, Smith and King, um, and I encountered some Jewish uh, uh, prejudice there because I'd worked for Weintraub, and they thought maybe I was Jewish too, or the person who just the person who interviewed me. It's a very fine firm, and Stuart Pollock worked there, but I just remember that being shocked by that. And then I walked over to uh, uh, a firm on Maple Avenue, Jeffers Mountain, and Franklin. And walked in. Uh, you know, it was like like going to uh, McDonald's and saying, "Do you need a counterman?" And I said, "You know, do you need a lawyer?" And, I'm, and they said, "Just you know, leave a resume," which I did. And then I was. Uh, they called me and said, um, "Come work for us." And so I did. 
did you at this point think of leaving New Jersey at all, or was New Jersey where you were going to base your practice and career? Um, I really wanted to stay in New Jersey, but I did. I went out to Denver uh, at the behest of a law firm and looked at it. I just didn't feel comfortable there. I looked in Milwaukee uh, as well, but I, I, New Jersey was uh, was where uh, where I wanted to be. I remember in searching for a place that I liked to live, I, I drove down to South Jersey when there was an encephalitis epidemic, the mosquitoes and the like, and the, the gestation period was like 20 days, and I was convinced after going down there that I was, that I, I was done. And I, after the 20 days, I started to have symptoms, but it was all, all, coming, uh, all coming from my head. Um, but I, I, this was a, a very, a good firm, um, very collegial. Worrell Mountain was was really my mentor there, who became a Supreme Court justice later on. He was a wonderful, wonderful man, and uh, I, I, that was a great, uh, great opportunity. And that's a typical uh, in, in those times of a New Jersey law firm. It's different than a New York firm or the like. You actually do anything that comes in the door, so to speak. Um, which is nice. I, I was doing mm -hmm. corporate work, uh, drawing wills, and doing some litigation and, and that type of thing. And then pretty soon, uh, um, I also became an assistant prosecutor in Morris County. That was part time at, at the time, time. Mm -hmm. so I kind of divided uh, my time. I uh, I was able to be an assistant prosecutor because I worked on Governor Hughes' uh, campaign. I'd never been involved in politics before, and I was, I got involved uh, with, with his run for governor, um, actually working as um, uh, the head, there weren't, a, there weren't any troops, as the head of Citizens for Hughes in Morris County. Uh, if you recall, he was down by 30 or 40 points, and he spent the whole summer going all over the state meeting people. And um, I didn't have a clue what to do. And, and uh, I guess naively, I called Josephine Margetts, who was the state committee, Republican state committee woman. Mm -hmm. And she was very nice. She really helped me. She told me what to do, and she <laughs> she even came to some of the events. I don't know, but she was, she was a, great, uh, a great lady. Um, and I was at the uh, War Memorial Building when President Kennedy came in to give a speech on, on Hughes's behalf. The, the administration did not want to come in when Hughes was down by 20 points because it, it, it was not a good idea to throw prestige there and then have, uh, have the election lost. But if you recall, uh, Mitchell uh, Eisenhower's uh, labor secretary was the Republican opponent, and uh, he, his campaign was hampered because he mm -hmm. slipped and fell in a broke men's room, broke his leg. Um, but Hughes was just tireless. You know, he an ex was an extraordinary, energetic person. And the margin closed, and he was, it was even, or he was down one percent when Kennedy said he would come. And that was an extraordinary experience. I, as head of Citizens for Use in Morris County, I don't know how I managed to, to get there, but I was on the platform of the, of the war memorial uh, when Kennedy uh, came in. Before he came into the, you know, the parking lot, the state parking lot is right out in front. There were people, it was kind of dusk, there were people with torches and people coming from all over and marching into the, those parking lots and into the front of the War Memorial Building. I mean, there were thousands and thousands of people and uh, John Kennedy walked uh, past me, uh, really natty guy, great, <laughs> great suit and, and gave a wonderful uh, speech. So. I did get to see him uh, firsthand, but in any event, then Governor Hughes won, and and uh, I really wanted to be an assistant prosecutor, and uh, I, it happened. Apart from Joe Margetts, who was a Republican, 
did you have any other political mentors or influences? Did your brother influence you on your political path? No, no. I can't remember. Um, My brother had been U.S. attorney sometime before that, and I think he was uh, he he had developed multiple sclerosis by mm -hmm. this time. So, and of course, um, I guess Citizens for Use in Morris County was a thin <laughs> organization. Yeah, at Park that time. Masters was the head of Citizens all over the state. Mm -hmm. never, I don't know whatever happened to him, but mm -hmm. but uh, in terms of getting designated as head of citizens for use in the county um, were, were, were there political leaders then who had some say in the matter you know I don't remember I don't think so I don't know exactly how I pulled that off but uh, well, talked to somebody it was Morris County I went to uh, I went I guess I think I went to a meeting of that Park Masters and uh, his deputy, whose name escapes me now, was putting together to create this organization with the idea that this organization would function during the summer months when things were quiet and would, would arrange events for the governor to, uh, for uh, Judge Hughes at that mm -hmm. point to, to visit. And mm -hmm. Well, you, you described how energetic uh, Richard Hughes was as a campaigner. Any other personal recollections of his style or interaction with people? Um, he he was very uh, gregarious, as you know. He he would go to an event and he would give a, a talk, and then he would charm everybody by not leaving, but spending some time and walking around and uh, talking to people. And he was. Uh, extraordinarily appreciative of any effort that we put in to try to, to help him. I remember we had a Citizens Day in Morris County and uh, it was a long day, right, from morning to sometime at night and then he just said, let's all go to, uh, let's all go to dinner. We went to Rod's Ranch House uh, mm -hmm. late at night and uh, he just kept talking and it, for a young person that was that was heady stuff. And I assume that uh, John Kennedy's charisma also had an impact on your later career in public service too. No, no question. No question. I, I was not very uh, politically oriented before that in, in school or, or um, when I was cl uh, clerking. Um, my father was a Republican. I can't understand. It's still the case. I don't understand how uh, uh, Italians come in and they they become Republicans, or people who live in Hudson County or Democrats they move to Morris County they become Republicans. It's very it's very frustrating. But um, um, he uh, I, I I mean I took a great interest in in that campaign, and uh, I was. Uh, as uh, most everybody um, who liked him was just enthralled by the charisma that he had. But he did one other thing that was terrific. Whether you liked him or not, he had people up and interested and in debating and arguing with each other. I mean, the country was alive and, uh, and healthy. And his, uh, you know, his death certainly struck everybody a, a, a bad blow. So I don't need to dwell on that. But uh, describe the role of an assistant prosecutor at that time. As you said, it was a part-time job. How did you divide the time between private practice and the prosecutor's office? Well, I would say at the private office, I'm going to the prosecutor's office, and at the prosecutor's office, say I was going to the yeah. private office, and, and I go swimming. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you know, you just you just did what you had to do to to resolve both uh, both obligations. The um, the prosecutor's office uh, when I started was really part time. Uh, there was a, like a week of grand jury, and then or two weeks, and then four weeks where nothing was happening, and then a trial session of a week or two. And I'm told that before I arrived in Morris County, everything almost 
literally shut down for the summertime. I mean, people, lawyers, went out and had recreation. And I mean, it must have been a nice way, uh, nice way to live. But uh, and as as I stayed there, it it changed. I mean, Morris County started to develop, and pretty soon there was grand juries all the time, and there were trial. You got a week off between trial session. So it really became essentially full time. I mean, you really had to uh, had to devote a lot of effort to it. Uh, Frank Sherbo was the prosecutor in those days. He was a friend of Brendan's, uh, a remarkably interesting uh, man. Uh, never prepared very much for anything. I tried a corruption <laughs> case with him and I had I had the documents, but he had the rhetoric, you know, he would, I saw him in a civil case sum up, uh, he was defending a, the uh, a, um, gun manufacturer and he started talking about the wagon trains going across the plains and it was just, uh, just wonderful. But Brendan Byrne used to come up uh, a lot to see Frank because they were friends and I got to know Brendan Byrne more during those forays, but he and Frank, Brendan would come with a whole bunch of photographers and reporters and they would go out to Rockaway Township and look down a mine uh, ostensibly to try to see if there was a body down there and then have a picture <laughs> taken and come back. And we would go to Trenton, uh, Arthur Sills was the Attorney General, to meetings with the Attorney General and uh, Frank took me, Frank Sherba took me along and then we would have uh, usually have dinner with Brendan and some of his people, so it was mm -hmm. a it was a good time. Um, it was um, everyone everyone really pitched in. There weren't there weren't a lot of homicides in Morris County in those days, but there were. It started to grow, and there was uh, there was enough to keep everyone occupied. And and the idea was that. The assistant prosecutors, I don't know that this is a good one, would go to the crime scenes and and uh, look at uh, all of these cadavers and what uh, what had occurred. Uh, they even gave me a gun and ammunition, made me take it. So I took the gun home and put it in one place and put the ammunition somewhere else. It was uh, it was a uh, a growing experience. After a couple of years as assistant prosecutor, you're promoted to first assistant prosecutor. How did your duties change, if at all? Um, <clears throat> they were essentially the same, except I had some supervisory responsibilities over other assistants who were in the office. Uh, the office was small enough so that you really didn't exercise a lot of supervisory <laughs> authority, but you had trying to keep track administratively of things that were happening. and also having more to say to uh, to the chief of detectives and the captain of detectives and and the like. Well, now do you sort of think again about your career path after spending four years, more or less, in the pro prosecutor's position and also trying to balance private practice with that, choosing one path or the other, public service versus, versus a private law career? Well, I had... Uh, I had four kids uh, by that time, so um, I think it was 1967 or so when it, the, the two things just became uh, too much to handle <coughs> to, to do a, a solid job in both places. Um, so I resigned from the prosecutor's office to try to develop a private practice to support my family uh, and myself. And um, then the New Jersey Supreme Court appointed me as a bar examiner and I spent five years drawing questions for the bar exam <coughs> and grading uh, the, a the, the booklets, the answers. I mean, the summer exam, there were 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 books. I mean, it was really, uh, ah, it was murder. <laughs> I would think, be one of the more tedious tests yeah. you know, that you could dream up. And after, you know, it was, after a while you wondered, uh, it, it's that it's that feeling. Am, am I am I putting an objective standard here? Uh, I you, you read a lot of bad books, and all of a sudden there's a good one, and then you say to yourself, Is it that good, or is it because I read it after these? And you do draw a 
<coughs> an outline of points that one should uh, one should make and can grade it on that basis. But I think that the, the uh, we changed the the bar exam. It used to be uh, have like 32 subjects, including federal uh, income tax, and uh, we reduced it to five contracts, torts, and constitutional law, basic things, because uh, uh, we decided what we were interested in whether, is whether this person thought and wrote like a lawyer. Um, a, a person is in a law firm, if he gets to some specialized case, he goes and looks it up in the library. It was unfair, really, to to try to test people on a wide variety of, of topics. Uh, the basics were uh, were sufficient, we thought. Uh, and we were there when the multi-state started, by the way. I'll stop. No, uh, I, I sort of wanted to explore a little bit uh, in terms of legal education. Do you think uh, lawyers then were trained better or worse than they are today? I really, that's, I don't have the empirical basis to, uh, to really evaluate that. Um, I think when when uh, there was less uh, of a uh, burden on work, and when you had smaller law firms in in Morristown, for example, I think people received more attention from their uh, uh, supervisors, and uh, it was a very collegial relationship, and maybe people assimilated more uh, certainly now especially in big firms it's pretty uh, it's pretty uh, it's straightforward and an objective and people are assigned to certain cases and that's what they're going to work on it's not as personal and I think maybe the personal side we're missing these days and I think that's important to the development of a lawyer mm -hmm. and you mentioned you had the pressure of a growing family uh, uh, again <laughs> Did the sort of options between large law firm practice versus small town practice uh, weigh itself toward the toward the larger firm because of the economics? No, I was happy where I was. Uh, it was I had some very every everyone really got along well. It was a very uh, collegial place. My, my best friend Tom Bitar came to the firm the year after I was there, so that made it uh, that made it even better. Um, and I wasn't even thinking about making move. You know, people didn't move around that much uh, mm -hmm. in those days. Any, now, now everyone moves from firm to firm. I really wasn't thinking about moving. But and I was, I had a lot of uh, good clients, and I was, uh, I was content. I had the uh, the firm name was Jeffers Mountain and. Franklin, I th may have mentioned that before, and Franklin was Ben Franklin, who was a descendant of of he, Ben Franklin, and he he represented a lot of corporations, close corporations, small uh, corporations, and then he, uh, about seven or eight months after I arrived, he left to take a general counsel's uh, position, and uh, I inherited what he was doing, which was which was great experience because I was thrown right in the middle of all kinds of uh, things that I <coughs> really didn't have a lot of expertise mm -hmm. in and had to develop uh, the, the uh, feeling. Um, and so that that led to uh, more clients and, and the like. And um, we also at that time represented a uh, natural gas company that was putting bringing natural gas to the Northeast, and there were <coughs> ad valorem tax situations. How do you tax a piece of pipe in a, in a taxing district? And, and there was, um, the, when, when a new line was approved by the Federal Power Commission, acquiring the right of way or starting condemnation actions so that the pipeline could be constructed, that took a lot of time. That was interesting work. Mm -hmm. Did you do your much criminal defense work, given that you, were, I assume, had developed relationships in the prosecutor's office? I didn't do uh, a lot at that time. Um, 
I did some pro bono work. Um, Bert Polo, who was in the prosecutor's office for a while, he was the first assistant, uh, became a juvenile judge. And he gave me a, an assignment uh, for a kid who had broken into a house and held a knife to a woman's head and burglarized the place. And uh, I met him at the uh, youth center, and he was really incorrigible. Uh, I didn't like his mother and all that kind of stuff. But I, I we, and Polo, uh, Judge Polo worked, he was the juvenile judge then. We worked hard because this kid had a lot of positive qualities. And I don't know, it was a, probably the longest pro bono juvenile assignment in, in history. But I think we, I was doing this for a year and a half. But somehow <clears throat> we got him into the Marines uh, by expunging some of the things that were in his record. And uh, I actually went up and sat and talked to the woman who had the knife at her head and got her to agree that she would give the kid a chance. And he went into the Marines and he was doing extraordinarily well. I, I remember being in a, <clears throat> at a traffic light in Morristown. He was home on leave and he knocked on the window. I didn't recognize uh, who he was. Um, unfortunately, there was a car accident a few months later and he died. Uh, mm. It's too bad. He, uh, you know, I, I guess uh, there are a lot of people who do a lot of things on a pro bono basis to try to make a difference in someone's life. And doing something like that really uh, is important.